Good evening and welcome to St. George's House in Conversation. And I do hope that wherever you're watching from this evening, the weather is as beautiful with you as it is here in the grounds of Windsor Castle. And thank you for joining us. I'm especially pleased tonight to have as our guest Munira Mirza. Uh, Munira is the CEO of an organization called Civic Future. And in 10 days time, that organization will be here at St. George's House in person uh, as part of a weekend consultation. But many of you, of course, will know Munira from her very public profile as a director of the policy unit at number 10 from 2019 to 2022 during the premiership of Boris Johnson. And before that, as a deputy mayor of London with responsibility for education and culture. Uh, and if we go a little bit further back, Munira grew up in Oldham in Greater Manchester. Uh, she did her A-levels at Oldham Sixth Form College and was the only student in her year to gain a place at Oxford where she studied uh, English literature before going on to the University of Kent and a PH and a PhD. Um, Munira, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to St. George's House. Since those days at university, you've held senior positions in government, in academia, in the cultural sector and in business. And I'm sure we'll touch on a, a number of those areas over the course of the next 45 minutes. But I thought I'd start with uh, civic future. And I think it would be of real interest to our listeners tonight to hear a little bit about the origins of that organization and indeed its purpose. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to, to do this conversation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, so civic future I set up uh, last year, uh, we're a charity uh, that aims to identify and encourage more talented people to go into public life and into politics, but also importantly to educate people who go into uh, government and into public institutions about uh, the challenges facing the UK today. So uh, we uh, have a fellowship programme, uh, which uh, uh, we've uh, just recruited our first cohort and uh, we are providing uh, seminars, uh, residential conferences, one overseas trip, to, to give them a sense of the big issues that the UK has to face, whether it's geopolitics, um, uh, the, the uh, economy and the big challenges around economic growth, whether it's public policy, uh, a whole range of, of, of issues, but also the skills and an understanding of how power works in, in institutions. So uh, we're, we're not party political, we're cross party, uh, and it's, I think it's very important to, to make that point. Uh, and we do a range of programmes and training. But really, uh, it's, it's, it's partly, uh, the idea partly comes from my time in government and having met many talented people who work in, in government, uh, being very conscious that, and I include myself in this, uh, that most of us are not really prepared. There isn't really training or education for those kinds of jobs. And yet, in every other industry, we take quite seriously the idea that you need to find great people and you need to prepare them and give them the kind of the shared collective wisdom of all the people who've done it before. And we don't really do that very well in this country, I think. So uh, I hope this this is um, uh, a way, really, of, of trying to improve leadership in the future. Yeah, and so in, in, in some ways, civic future is filling a gap that you've identified. And I was looking at, um, at your website, Munira, and um, the word stagnation occurs quite prominently several times on the, on the kind of the homepage. Uh, and there's one line which struck me in particular. Uh, there is a sense that everywhere that nothing is working as it should, that our leaders are not up to the task, and that permanent stagnation defines our era. Um, is it really that bad? <laughs> uh, I I think it's important for people who have worked in politics to be honest. Um, I don't think we have enough honesty about 
the challenges that we face. And we, and we have, uh, and this is not just the politicians, I think we have a media culture that uh, wants politicians to promise easy solutions and no trade-offs. And uh, so I, uh, we made a very conscious decision, me and my team, that uh, and we have a, a, a great advisory council as well, but we made a very conscious decision that we should be open and honest about why this is needed and um, that the challenges are grave. Uh, we talk about we did a conference in July on economic stagnation at Cambridge and we we worked with uh, many academics, but also people working in business, people uh, who are working in the civil service, politicians to talk about an issue which really is significant. And yet we don't have, I think, sophisticated conversations about it in public. Um, crucially, we had people at the event who are from the Labour side, but also from the Conservative side. And uh, I, I was I was actually, I mean, I was proud of the fact that people were having thoughtful conversations, being honest with each other about what it would take to help Britain to to improve its its economic growth. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think stagnation is not just an economic problem. I think culturally in our institutions, the sense that things don't work or there's fragmentation. Uh, and uh, so these are the kinds of things that we want politicians to own up to. And you can't fix the problems unless you really appreciate the scale of them, I think. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's a huge job to turn that around with the politicians, of course. But I suppose the backbone of the, the political infrastructure is the civil service. Uh, and, and, and I wonder just what your perception of the current state of the civil service is. I mean, gosh, that's a... That is a big question because I think, uh, and I, I want to avoid giving a glib answer, I think the civil service for a start is not one single organisation. Sure. And people assume that civil servants are the people who sit in Whitehall along that very large road uh, with the grand buildings. And in fact, many civil servants do not work in London at all and they work in operational roles. They might be uh, working in job centres. Uh, and they might be, uh, you know, some of them are working in the armed services. So uh, I think it's important to be precise about what we mean. Um, I think there are there are some parts of the civil service which are excellent and which, you know, we would say without any doubt is extremely well run. Um, I mean, I think we all saw the way that the the, the Queen's funeral was uh, was managed. You know, I would trust my life to whoever was organising uh, the, the the clockwork around that. Um, but I think the 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 challenge that everybody recognizes is that uh, there are bureaucracies, there are uh, uh, there is a, a risk averse culture often in Whitehall. Um, we don't train civil servants, I think, as well as we used to. Um, and you know it's important not to be nostalgic about the past, but I think there is a general view that the people coming in do not get given enough time to do learning and development. Um, I think is the the civil service is certainly diversified, which is good. Um, but uh, it's it has got uh, pockets of low morale. I think uh, people uh, probably uh, you know the, the pay is not been keeping up probably with um, uh, with uh, rates uh, that, that the very talented people could get in other sectors, uh, and that that's a factor. Um, but I think this this general problem that it's slow and bureaucratic and often risk averse, and we can talk about the reasons for that. But um, that is uh, something that people have talked about for many years, if not decades. Um, my my colleague and I, um, my colleague is Pamela Dow, who is a uh, a sort of lifetime civil servant. She, um, in fact, was running uh, a new training and uh, skills development program. Uh, campus for the for the civil service um, and then and then came to work with me um, she makes the point that um, you know there are uh, uh, you know really talented people but often they want to leave um, and that even though everyone knows that there are solutions there are things that we could do we could stop people having to move around every two years in order to get promotion and uh, you know we could provide better training um, it's uh, and, and there are so many uh, reports and think tank reports about how to fix the civil service uh, it doesn't seem to change and I think you need will from the top to really make that happen. Right and what do you think about the relationship between the civil service and the SPADs you know the special mm -hmm. advisors? 
Uh, every minister it's, brings in their special yeah. advisors that can only create tension, surely. So I, I, I had a, um, and you know, maybe this is a very partial view, um, but I ran a, quite an unusual team in government because the policy unit, at least for the last 20 or so years, has been uh, half civil servants and half special advisors, but we work as a single team. And so it was actually a very, I think, a very productive, um, uh, really positive atmosphere. And uh, I'm still very good friends with um, many of the civil servants and the SPADs that I worked with. Um, and I think the reason it worked is that everybody understood that they played a particular role. Special advisors, um, and actually, in fact, again, people have a perception that all special advisors are just party hacks and they come in and all they know is about how to win elections and that's all they care about. Actually, many of the special advisors we recruited into number 10 and in some of the departments were policy experts first and foremost. And uh, I, I would say actually a few of them were not even conservative and, and, and not particularly interested in the Westminster politics. Um, but special advisors that are often a very quick and straightforward way of bringing in outside expertise. And that's one of the the challenges I would say in the civil service, bringing in expertise from industry, from science and technology, um, from other fields. So I, I think uh, special advisors do play an important role. Civil servants also play an important role and their view and their way of running things and looking at things needs to be alongside what the special advisors do. And where it worked really well was when you had a, a really strong sense of the overall objective, you know, the, the manifesto that, that the government was elected on and uh, really talking about how how can you deliver that? What are the, uh, uh, the pros and cons of particular policies? In some cases, having to amend the policy and a civil servant being quite frank and saying, I, I don't think this is a good idea and this is why. And we did change often what we were doing. Um, as a result of those conversations. So I have a more positive view of that relationship. I know that it's not always the same in departments. There can be tension. But in in our case, I think it was a creative and positive um, relationship. Yeah. And then just taking it up a level, thinking about uh, ministerial appointments, uh, often people will be appointed to positions, be it the health, Secretary of State for Health, Secretary of State for Defence, whatever it is, without any real experience of that sector. Mm. Um, and it's always struck me as a very strange business to put somebody in charge of something so important who really has no background in it at all. It's not always the case, but it often is the case. Is that a good idea? Uh, so m my view on this is that, well, we need, we need more people from different professional backgrounds to go into politics. And I, I hope that some of the people listening to this conversation, uh, if they're not already engaged in public life, would be willing and interested to, to, to get involved. And uh, as well as our fellowship programme, which is, is more about young people, we also have a breakfast series where we encourage people who are uh, um, the more experienced end of life uh, who maybe 30 40 years ago might well have gone into politics but now today don't don't go into politics and there are lots of reasons why that is but but we think that there's a whole um, you know, there's a whole generation of very talented people who we should be trying to to involve in public life um, but um, with 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 appointing cabinet ministers I take the view that we need ministers who have different kinds of professional experience, but who are well-rounded enough and who are given enough opportunity to learn about different areas of policy so that when they do arrive in those roles, they have a sufficient grounding, an intellectual grounding and a worldview that helps them to navigate new areas. So um, I think that's where we can make a difference. Um, I don't think anybody uh, would expect the Secretary of State for Science and Technology to be an expert on AI. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be very hard these days to be an expert on AI and to be completely up to speed with what's happening. But they should have a broad understanding of the idea of what's now called exponential technology. They should have some understanding of what Britain uh, is doing in that area, what the kind of thorny philosophical issues are. You don't need to be a professional expert, but you do need to have some kind of uh, view of the world uh, before you go into these roles. And I, I agree. And, I, you know, I think, again, we should be honest. 
too many people who who end up in those roles have not been politicians for very long right. uh, and they have not been given a chance to think about any of these issues or encouraged to to think about them. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, do they get time to think about them? You know, there will be a reshuffle, we're told, uh, any time now. Uh, so let's just say, hypothetically, the Secretary of State for Health will be moved to education. That will happen with a phone call from the Prime Minister. And the next thing you know, you're in a different office. Where's the time to learn, to get yeah. up to speed with the the um, the policy, the intellectual uh, background? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, there's been so much uh, 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 turnover and change in the last few years, but it, it has it has been a characteristic, actually, of probably the last 15, 20 years, where I think the Department for Education has probably gone through about uh, a dozen different uh, secretaries of state um, in not just under a conservative government, but in the previous uh, the Labour administrations, there were, was also quite a lot of change. And some departments are just more subject to it than others, like DCMS, I think. they very People very rarely stay that long. I think Ed Vasey probably was a, more long-standing than some of the others. Right. Um, so that, that I think, is uh, it's also a reflection of unsettled times in politics. And I, I agree. I think it's a problem because being Secretary of State, you do have to make significant decisions. And you... And, 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 Unfortunately, because there's so often churn in the civil service as well, the mm. people that you're relying on to have institutional memory, policy memory, are themselves fairly new in the job sometimes. So uh, I think that that sense of churn is a problem. Um, but but the answer is not so much that you, you must always have a medical professional doing the job of a cabinet minister. I think, in, you know, the Department for Health, I think you need people who go into politics to have more of an apprenticeship more time spent reading, ideally when they're an MP. But the reality is, I and this is why we we try and reach people before they're at that stage, political candidates, people interested in their 20s, because we're saying to them, this is a long, long game and you have to spend a few years really developing yourself and preparing for a role like that. And uh, Munira, if I could, let me just take you back to number 10 and that that period, 2019 to 22, uh, I mean, I wouldn't dream of asking you to uh, break state secrets, but I'm, I'm just very interested in what kind of experience it was. The sense from outside was certainly a certain element of chaos. Um, what, stu what stood out for you in, the, in that period? Uh, so obviously it's hard when you haven't got anything else to compare it to. And... Um... You know, I, I think it's it's an it's not a secret that the the Johnson administration um, did have a lot of churn and uh, uh, it was uh, quite stormy at times and individuals uh, disagreed. Uh, so uh, there, there's obviously an issue of the personalities and the principle and and the um, uh, the fact that we did we did as soon as we went into government in July 2019 we were almost really in election mode. Um, but actually, my there were different phases as well. And the first six months, that period before the election and then during the election campaign, uh, it was actually a very well-functioning team um, because there was a mission and there was a, a strong policy agenda. Uh, we were, you know, obviously uh, there was a commitment to deliver the results of the, the referendum. Uh, there was also a desire to invest in public services, to increase and invest in infrastructure, levelling up. Uh, there was a sense in which it was both a, a kind of policy programme and a moral mission. And we were going out to the country during the election and asking them to back us. And that felt like a, uh, it had a dynamism to it. Um, I, I do think um, that personalities to one side, we only had a few weeks before in, in January um, to, to try and do anything before COVID hit. And um, and this is, it's hard because you don't want to use the pandemic as an excuse, but it genuinely did absorb the vast majority of government for, for a, a good period of time. And any good work that we were able to do, I wasn't actually, we, we decided in number 10 to separate out team so that some people carried on working on the domestic policy agenda which I did so for most of the period I wasn't involved in decisions about COVID I was working on social care or NHS um, waiting times or education policy 
uh, and uh, uh, the things that we did do, which I'm proud of, didn't really get very much attention um, because the media were talking about COVID the whole time. And that is just the way it is. So um, uh, obviously there are things that, you know, in, in, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have had to deal with. But, um, you know, all politics is it, it has that. The, the other thing I think is that number 10s, uh, at least for the last 20, 30 years, and I've spoken to people who've been special advisors and civil servants under different uh, governments of, of different political parties, and they all make the point that it can be chaotic. You're dealing with a ferocious news cycle. Um, you're always firefighting. There's always a crisis the next day you're trying to avoid. And there is just a, 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 a difficulty of getting ahead and thinking long term and being strategic. And, um, you know, in, in politics, it's even harder when po the political party itself is divided on what to do and your membership and your parliamentarians have uh, divergent views. So I don't think it's fair just to blame individual people. I think that there, you know, it was an incredibly difficult and challenging period. And, um, uh, you know, there isn't, in an ideal world, you'd have unity in a political party, but even with an 80 seat majority, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't come so easily. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's interesting that you mentioned the NHS, and, and I will just uh, come back to that in a moment. But um, if you were looking in retrospect at, at COVID, marks out of 10 for how it was handled. I know there's an inquiry going on at the minute, and mm. much will come out of that. I, if you don't mind, I'm not going to give marks out of 10, because I think it's just an impossible task. Sure. Um, I like I said I wasn't I wasn't directly involved really in in the decisions um uh including the initial decision to lock down where I suppose there was a you know there was a genuine philosophical debate about the extent to which any government has the right to constrain people's freedoms in that way um I don't think any country did it perfectly uh and clearly there are lessons to be learned. I, you know, I myself um, have been asked to provide a witness statement, um, even though I wasn't even that involved. Um, and I, you know, I, I think there are lessons to be learned about, you know, the way that uh, uh, data was initially gathered and presented, and uh, and uh, the systems within government did not necessarily, uh, they weren't on a war footing straight away. Uh, things in Whitehall are slow, and yet you're trying to essentially fight a war on your own home turf. You're trying mm -hmm. to fight a pandemic. And most people are not used to working at that pace or being operational. Um, I think the, the important thing is, yes, learn the lessons and then fix the problems. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think we've probably, we've probably figured out how to run the inquiry before we figured out our biosecurity strategy for the country. And something's probably not... Not right there, but um, okay. uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, it needs improving, probably, or satisfactory somewhere along those lines. I would say okay. that's 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 that's. But fair don't enough. quote me on it, please. That will be I, on the front page of a news. news no, no, page. no, 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 no. Don't worry, it's Chatham House rules. Um, and and just uh, thinking about the twenty-four hour news cycle, which uh, you mentioned earlier, the pressure that that puts on politicians, that surely has transformed political culture whether for good or ill. Yeah, I think I'm just about old enough to remember a period where in the 90s you waited for the news pretty much each day and, uh, you know, you read the papers in the morning and it felt like not much was changing in, in the rest of the day. That is not the case now and there's something happening all the time and uh, obviously there are, there are more media outlets and there are, all, there are lots of journalists looking for stories uh, i also think the industry of political journalism around westminster has uh, uh it, it certainly feels bigger than it did 10 15 years ago i don't know if that's, that's scientifically accurate um but it definitely feels like there's just more opportunities to screw up and for it to be noticed and that makes government i think constantly watching its own back and uh, i don't think there is an easy answer to that because I, I wouldn't want to curtail media scrutiny i think actually media scrutiny is probably the most effective opposition any government can have and it does keep you honest um but i think sometimes that kind of gotcha quality in the media where 
uh, you need an answer straight away. And Prime Minister, what do you think of you know Geronimo the alpaca? You must have an answer. And um, actually, he might not have an answer. He might not have an opinion, or he might want to think about it for a while, and uh, or, you know, or do nothing. And there is a kind of unforgiving quality to um, to the way that the stories like that can be covered. Yeah. And, and just taking your back up for a moment to something you mentioned earlier, the referendum, of course. Uh, Brexit is back in the news today with the UK rejoining the Horizon programme. And I'm just thinking, you you know, you were a fairly vocal supporter of Brexit. How do you think it has gone or is going? Um, so, I, I mean, I think we, I would certainly recognise, I think, uh, uh, it would be wrong to deny that there have been lots of short-term problems for uh, certain businesses, certain sectors. My background is the cultural sector, yeah. and I know that m musicians struggle with touring still, and uh, you know some things have been improving, but there has been short-term disruption. Um, we also have, uh, you have to see it in the round of uh, some of the things that we did do uh, when, we, when we left the EU. So I was involved in uh, amending regulations around gene editing, uh, so that we can uh, allow more research into quite an important cutting area, cutting edge area of technology uh, that will help agriculture and uh, and help farmers. So I think there are positives as well. The positives get less attention. I have to say, when the when the bill passed on gene editing, hardly anybody noticed. And I had a very um, uh, amusing but depressing conversation with a special advisor from the department that was responsible for it a few weeks afterwards. And I mentioned it, and he didn't realise it had happened. Um, and he, I mean, he was fairly new in the job. He'd been there a few months, but uh, it did feel that even people in Westminster, inside the inside the bubble, don't don't always know. Um, but I, you know, my view on Brexit was always, um, uh, you know, and, and you know, unfortunately, because the the the, the negotiation, the the renegotiation of the um, uh, that Cameron originally led, um, didn't didn't produce something that the the British public were happy about. Um, that it was um, it was about uh, uh, regaining uh, democratic control over quite important areas of policy, and uh, but for me it was never about cutting off from Europe or cutting off from the world. It was about a new relationship and the opportunity to do things differently. And you know we we talk a lot in politics about short termist thinking and not being long term. It is really a long term policy to leave the eu it's uh, uh and it's going to take time for um uh for that relationship to reform and for um you know and, and, and some of it is about uh, uh avoiding other risks and dangers down the line rather than an immediate result or an immediate benefit but um you know i i, I think the country uh and, and, and most people have accepted the result uh and uh recognize that we have to move on from there yeah, and and just thinking more um more globally and and the UK's place in the world at the moment, I mean I think there's a real sense that the tectonic plates are shifting. We look now to India, to China, yeah. to all of that. Um, you know, here is a here is a country that had one of the great empires of uh, history, but really is something of a bit player at the moment. And um, I mean, do you think the UK? punches above its weight anymore? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, it's interesting um, that the, um, the the story for the last few years has been that the, the, the UK is the sick man of Europe or the sick country of Europe. And, and obviously the revision to the ONS figures on the size of the economy, uh, which I, I don't know because I'm not a pollster, but I don't know how much that has actually fed through to public consciousness yet. But it does slightly change the narrative that, that we are, I mean, we still have problems. I, I think we have to... Um, uh, we still have to deal with the, the question of productivity and economic growth, but the idea that we are uniquely much worse than than our European neighbours, uh, uh, I think uh, probably we do need to to revise that picture a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean the world has changed. We're not in a world where America is the only dominant player, and to some extent, America, uh, depending on who wins the next presidential election, uh, may not want that role anymore. And Britain has to have new alliances. And, uh, and you know, the, when I was in number 10, my colleague, uh, John Bew, Professor John Bew, was responsible for developing a new integrated strategy, a foreign foreign affairs strategy, which uh, talked a great deal more about 
uh, the the countries in Asia and the Pacific in the Pacific tilt and and trying to uh, um, to build those relationships in a way that are uh, you know respects the the history um, that we have with some of those countries, but um, uh, and doesn't doesn't uh, assume any entitlement on the part of Britain. Um, but I, you know, I think Britain uh, does have a, you know, an important role to play, and uh, you know, and we, when we're not leaders in the way that that we once were as a as a country in, in, in charge of an empire. Obviously, I'm a child of the empire myself, um, and, and nor would we want to be. But uh, if you look at the the way in which Britain is uh, leading, I think a conversation about AI and regulation. I do think that that people still, you know, value what we what, what role we can play. Yeah. And, and you mentioned, Munira, you mentioned um, America there. And America, of course, is where we in the West look to and have always looked to in, in, in some way. Uh, with your with a political hat on, when you look at America today, what do you see politically? Oh, uh, I see some things that I hope we try and avoid in the UK. I think the level of polarisation is depressing. I mean, I I grew up in the pretty much in the eighties, and for me, America was this uh, fantastic, exciting, um, you know, increasingly very multicultural place. It felt like New York was a melting pot. It's culturally um, uh, forward looking, and it feels like it's enervated as a country. It's lost that energy, and the uh, becoming more tribal. Um, you know, people are talking very openly about the idea of potential civil war. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, I think it is, uh, you know, it was important that the people who tried to essentially create and cause an insurrection uh, in, 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 um, in January, on the 6th of January, um, you know, are properly, you know, that, that's, you know, properly recognised and they're treated with a degree of seriousness. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the, the the cultural divisions in America are also potentially uh, overcome by the fact that they do have this incredible dynamism still in their economy. I mean, um, it's it, it's hard to deny the fact that, that they are, you know, they are building semiconductor factories. And um, uh, there is a sense in which, you know, and the, the levels of prosperity there are still higher than in Europe. So something is working. And as long as America is a place where a migrant can grow up and still think they could be, um, you know, successful and, and, and prosperous, that story, I think, is still pretty powerful. But, I mean, gosh, I hope that we avoid that kind of mudslinging that they have there. And I think the media has just become, has started to pander more and more to that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully, I think we still have a centre ground where you can have, you know, we had a, a conference uh, the, uh, uh, earlier this year, we were involved in a conference, and we had you know someone there from the Observer newspaper, someone there from the Telegraph. They were having a, an intelligent, thoughtful conversation about the issue of race and inequality. I don't think you could get that in the US, and um, you know we must must fight to preserve that here. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, disruptors are often a good thing, and you know you need people to stir things and shake things up. But, but do you think Trump was perhaps a disruption too far? Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, my, my personal view is, I, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, he is, let, let's, let's say, you know, a, a flawed individual, um, to put it mild, put it mildly. I think what he reflected or represented, though, was uh, a, a section of opinion in public society, in in in, in the public in America, um, of feeling left behind by globalization, being left behind by the economic model they have in, in the U.S. Um, you know, many, many jobs in these heartland areas had gone to China, had gone to uh, Mexico. And Trump said, look, I'm speaking for these guys and their concerns and their anxieties about immigration. And, uh, you know, he whether he fixed those problems that he claimed that he would as a, as a debate, but uh, he gave expression to public opinion that that was almost silenced out of both the Republican and the Democrat Party. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a reminder, really, that if mainstream parties don't talk about issues the way that the public think about them, then fringe groups and extreme groups do rise up. Yeah, and um, let let me take you back a bit further. You mentioned earlier that you indeed are a, a child of empire, as it were, you know, of Pakistani origin. You grew up in the northwest of England, 
And I'm just wondering how much that childhood experience and growing up where you did uh, has shaped your own political philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm sure on, on many levels it has. I think growing up, up in Oldham in a, a small town uh, which was deindustrialized uh you know decades ago uh and 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 seeing uh a kind of uh yeah i guess a sense of, of, of being disconnected from london and the southeast so i'm sure that's um influenced my politics and made me uh you know deeply aware of regional inequality um uh, also, it's a it, Oldham is a town where there were racial tensions, and uh, but at the same time, a great deal of public spiritedness. And uh, you know, for for every racist experience I had, I had hundreds more of positive encounters with you know white teachers, white neighbours, white school friends. So uh, I guess uh, coming to London, I you know you, you bring all of these things with you. Um, I've I've not I I don't know if it's influenced my view on uh, economic policy or what I think we should do on the NHS. Um, I think that's come from years of thinking and reading and talking to other people. Um, and I I I I never like it when people in politics claim that they have some higher understanding of the ordinary person because they grew up outside London. I think there are um, you know that's sometimes a bit self serving that narrative. Um, but I guess I guess you know ultimately I, on 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 issues like culture and and, and race and identity, um, I've uh, you know I've experienced what it's like to be an outsider, and it's something I care about trying to address. Uh, I uh, I'm also sceptical of some of the ways that that people have talked about it, and I've been very public about that. Um, uh, and you know because fundamentally I think I think identifying and treating people on the basis of their race uh leads us into all sorts of problems and and you know we should just be mindful of that yeah and what, what particular problems do you think i know you've written and spoken mm. about institutional racism and uh, uh, etc but you know so what, what what problems do you think it leads us into well i think that, i mean the, i could talk about this at length but the two things i would i would say are um sometimes the biggest social problems and the biggest uh, challenges facing communities and families is not their race but their economic position it might be where they live in the country uh, it could be uh, a result of uh, cultural differences if we're honest um, I you know I grew, grew up in a, a Muslim community many Asian women uh, choose not to work and, and that's their choice and that that's a you know a preference but it does mean you have families with only one person earning an income and that can mean you have uh, lower levels of uh, 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 higher levels of poverty, and, and uh, 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 but but that's not you know that's not racism as such. Yeah. It's 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 inequality that that you can see is presented around particular groups. But I think there's sometimes a little bit of a, a tendency sometimes in policy to to say, well, if it's a, a particular ethnic group, then they must be somehow a victim of society. And so I think more nuance and more understanding about why groups face different and unequal outcomes. Um, and then when it comes to individuals, I've always been, and I, I felt this strongly when I was growing up, I've always felt that um, the, the dignified thing to do with individuals is to treat them as individuals and to not give special treatment to people on the basis of their ethnicity. Um, and it's Probably that is something that's been shaped by my experience. I hated the idea that I would have been given an, a place at um, university or treatment on a special programme or got an extra you know, boost in my exam results because of because someone felt charitable towards me. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess as a point of pride, um, I felt that uh, you know, I wanted to be treated equally. And so, um, and I, you know, obviously there's a lot of, complexity there about the fact that you know some people don't get to go to great schools and and how do we, we deal with that I think we should try and have a level playing field but when it comes to individuals we you know the there are people who with all the best intentions of the world want to help those who are lower down on the ladder or who they think are disadvantaged but it can sometimes have these counterproductive effects and 
Um, I think it's as somebody who is an ethnic minority in Britain. Uh, I know my friends who are ethnic minorities, my family, we talk about this quite honestly with each other. And um, I think my white friends are sometimes surprised to hear these views, but they are views that are expressed um, amongst brown and black people in Britain. I mean, you've been on a fairly extraordinary political journey. If you look at, you know, the revolutionary communist party as a youngster to number 10 Downing Street, it really is a, a, an unusual trajectory, is it not? Yeah, well, I have to say, each step of the way, it all made sense to me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, people's politics changed. I started off being very left wing um, uh, in the, you know, I cared a great deal about inequality. And actually, I still do. Um, uh, I mean, I wasn't a formal member of the, the Revolutionary Communist Party. I should add it disbanded many years before me. But, you know, I knew people who were very much on the on the left and defined themselves in that way. Um, I was always quite strongly in favour of free speech. I think that's been one constant in my life, that idea that ultimately individuals should have the right to make their own mind up and we, we shouldn't have uh, authorities like governments and, and, and regulators telling us what we can and can't hear. And I think that probably, um, you know, even, even in my early you know, teenage years, I, I guess I was a liberal and that's how I would define myself now. I think of myself as a kind of almost classical liberal, but, you know, and, and civic future, as I say, we're, we're grounded in the values of liberal democracy. Yeah how you translate those values to the world today, that is the challenge. That's what politics is about. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I change my mind all the time. I, you know, I, I, I talk to my colleagues and my team and we argue and we debate things. And, um, and that's why, you know, a society where you can debate things and disagree well is so important. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that unlike America, we can have young people growing up feeling that they're allowed to express their opinion and to hear different views. Uh, and I think I think debating things clearly and uh, coherently, debating well is precisely what St George's House is about. Mm. And I wonder if that isn't a fault line in politics that people, politicians, so rarely change their minds you know it's almost a weakness to change yeah. your mind but your political journey has been about changing your mind yeah and and uh i i think politicians are sometimes better once they've left politics and then they can afford to be honest and not pretend that they know everything uh, it's also a sign of immense intellectual confidence when when politicians do say i think i got we got that wrong um, as I said before, I don't think we have a very forgiving culture. Uh, when people say that, you know, you, you feel that admitting you got something wrong is a weakness um, and, and undermines anything you say in the future. Um, but it's, it, you know, uh, what do the public value? They value authenticity and honesty. And even when they don't agree with your policies, they can see that you're not just showboating. Yeah. So anyway, it's easy for me to say I'm not trying to get elected, so I can afford to say when I when I if I do uh, if I do get things wrong. But yeah. um, I I think that's one of the challenges. How how do politicians uh, say I made a mistake, but also how do they say no? I don't agree with you, mm -hmm. and this is why. And yeah. one of the things that that always has driven me mad about politics and political interviews is how politicians now feel that they they have to almost sort of agree with everybody um, because th they don't want to make any enemies. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought it strange that a policy really comes into being only after it's been through the focus group. And if the yeah. focus group doesn't like it, well, we're not going there. Uh, doesn't seem to me very principled. But what I haven't done, Munira, is um, concentrated at all on your interest in culture. And, you know, you. Mm. Uh, so I just wonder the state of the arts in the UK today, how do you how do you think the cultural life of the UK is at the moment? I know it's such a difficult question, but mm. uh, so I think it's a, in a better shape. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, and I was in government. Uh, we did put quite a lot of money into trying to help cultural organisations during COVID because they were um, really facing some of them, you know, existential threat. They were they'd lost their income overnight. Um, but they, you know, many of them 
uh, are clawing back slowly. And so the economics of working in the cultural sector, I think, is still pretty challenging. And obviously, there's a lot less sponsorship money sloshing around these days and ticket income and so on. Um, in general, though, uh, you know, Britain is one of Britain's great strengths. And I always say that the cultural sector is, is, is the best industrial strategy that's ever been that's ever been developed. And it, partly because it just wasn't an industrial strategy. It was government funding the BBC, funding art colleges, funding uh, uh, education in schools, um, uh, funding museums and galleries and um, and theatres. And, you know, we wouldn't have the pop music scene that we have today if it weren't for art schools in, in, in the 70s and, and the 80s. So um, it's a long, uh, a long uh, developed um, asset that we have um, and other countries around the world envy it because uh, they they would love to to reproduce it but it's it's everything it's, it's economically important it's soft power it's it unites people it allows space for disagreement I think you know there's group think in the cultural sector if I'm honest and I you know I found when it, you know when it came to Brexit it was impossible really to find any organization that was willing to uh, really, really, um, to 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 consider from the point of view of those who supported leaving the EU, why that was. Um, I did participate in a, a few discussions about it, but there weren't that many events uh, in the cultural sector, which I thought was a shame because I I think you know for the for the cultural sector to really um, continue to be relevant and feel vibrant, it needs to understand public opinion as well. Um, Manira, we're already over time, um, so I apologise for that. But before I finish, just one final quick question. Longer term, do you think you might be persuaded back into political life? Uh, so I feel in, in a way what I'm doing is political. It's just a very long term version of, of politics. And I, I wish somebody had set Civic Future up 20 years ago and I, I could have gone on the fellowship and, and, and some of my, my colleagues. Um, but it's you know it's a great honor and a privilege, and I would say to anyone listening to this that um, you know we we spend a lot of time in this country telling everyone how terrible politics is, but actually it is the most extraordinary thing that a day in number ten you can achieve some in incredible things, and you can make you can make a massive difference to people's lives, and we have to remember that the levers that you pull in government, and and also you know not just in in Whitehall, but but in in you know, mayoral offices, I worked in a mayor's office and uh, and even in local government, you can make a massive difference. And, and we just need to inspire people again um, and remind them that, you know, some of the pain that they experience is worth it. Great. Thank you. Well, Civic Future didn't exist 20 years ago, but you have set it up. So well done you. And I very much look forward to welcoming you and your colleagues here in person uh, yes. in, in 10 days time. But I'm mean, you know, I could talk for another hour and a half without any problem, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much for your support as well. And, and let me just finish by thanking our audience for listening. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's In Conversation, and I hope you'll join us again in the not-too-distant future. But from, from me here at St George's House tonight, good night.